Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. Coming up on the program, the United Airlines CEO is stepping down. Unique finds at a video rental store in Chicago and photographs from the Holocaust paint a complicated picture of a dark time. But first tonight, a new Trump administration rule change could leave hundreds of thousands of people without food stamp benefits. In a move announced yesterday, the Department of Agriculture says they will tighten work requirements for some recipients of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. The Trump administration says the change will save the federal government billions, but activists and politicians have called this decision cruel and unfair. Here to weigh in are Nolan Downey, a staff attorney specializing in public benefits programs at the Shriver Center on Poverty Law, which is opposing the new requirements, and Ted Dabrowski, president of the nonprofit WirePoints website, who is supportive of this rule change. Welcome both of you to Chicago Tonight. Thank you. Nolan Downey, first a primer. Who is eligible right now for food stamps and what are the benefits that they get? Well, Paris, to be eligible for food stamps, you have to meet income requirements. Um, right now in the state of Illinois for households that do not have a qualifying member, somebody that's over 60 or somebody that is struggling with a disability, they have to be under 165% of the poverty line. For households that do have those qualifying members, they have to be under 200% of the poverty line. So for this group, um, people that are, uh, quote, able-bodied, those are folks that would have to be below that 165%. And it's really important to remember when we're talking about SNAP that the benefits that people get on average are about $127 a month for benefit recipients. The maximum that a single person can get is only $194. These are benefits that go a long way in helping people supplement their food budgets but it's certainly not enough for them to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. Ted Dabrowski, we're talking about able-bodied adults. Those are the people that will be affected by this rule change. Able-bodied adults with no dependents. Tell us um, what exactly is going to change under this proposal. Well, so today, um, Illinois has had a waiver uh, for 101 counties out of the 102 counties have had a waiver from having to meet the, the work requirements. And those work requirements mean that anybody who's receiving food stamps should, and we're talking about, again, uh, able-bodied, single, younger than 50. Uh, if they are, if they are working, uh, sorry, to get to get the benefits, they must work uh, 20 hours a week or, or go through training, and that's how you get the benefits. But Illinois had a waiver from that, and so we've had some of the highest uh, uh, enrollment numbers in the country. And as I understand, the, the waiver applies to counties that have uh, unemployment rates that are 20 percent higher than the national average. So in those counties, yeah, the work uh, requirements do not apply. More people can get the SNAP benefits. What's going to happen now is if unemployment is above 6 percent, then they can get the waiver. So that, that shrinks the amount of people that can get the waiver. Nolan, um, why do you think this is a bad idea? Well, whenever we talk about this policy, it's really important that folks understand that when we're talking about this group, people that are between 18 and 49 on SNAP that don't have dependents, what we know about them is that they have significant barriers to maintaining that stable employment. Many of them suffer from physical or mental limitations that restrict their ability to get that gainful employment. Many of them are unstably housed. They're overrepresented in the population of folks experiencing homelessness. They have difficulty accessing reliable transportation, difficulty accessing technology. And the other important thing is that for these folks, they're dealing with incredibly few resources. What we know about them is that their income tends to be only a couple thousand dollars a year, and that SNAP is the only benefit that they're eligible for that helps them get by on a day-to-day -day basis. Ted Dabrowski, what about that? I mean, it seems like this rule change might be punishing um, those because they are not working and perhaps they can't find a job. Yeah, no, we should definitely take care of those people who, who really have a lot of those needs that uh, Nolan mentioned. Uh, but I think what we have to understand is that in, in, in a place like Illinois, we have really failed at getting people back to work. We have the seventh highest enrollment in food stamps in the country. And while our neighboring states have recovered and reduced the number of people on food stamps below what the levels were during the Great Recession, we are higher than that. So we are really outperforming. And that's just because Illinois has more counties that have higher unemployment you than know, the national it, average? We, we have, well, we, we've had a, a worse uh, employment performance. Uh, we've had a lot of other problems, as we've discussed on the show. Um, but um, what, what needs to happen, and here's what's interesting about this, we need to take care of those people. And in Illinois, because we've had so many people on food stamps for so long, you can understand it's going to be difficult to get, to get them back in the market. But this is about as good as it gets when you talk about the, the uh, employment levels. 
I mean, nationally, so, right nationally, right and in Illinois, right? We, our unemployment rate is much, much lower than it's been over the last decade. So this is the moment. If, if you if you want to get these people back to getting back into the workforce, uh, there's only a 3.9 percent unemployment rate unemployment rate in Illinois. This is the moment to get them back in because if we can't get them working again now then these people can be relegated to food stamps for the rest of their lives. What about that, Nolan? Is your understanding of the food stamp program uh, that it's supposed to be temporary and the goal is to get people off of it and, and back into self-sufficiency? Paris, I don't think there's any denying that a job is incredibly important in helping people meaningfully uh, improve their lives. What I've never understood about this policy is how starving people is going to help them get there. The truth is, when you take these benefits away from folks, that is not a recipe for self-sufficiency. It's not a recipe for economic stability. That's a recipe for taking a bunch of folks that have barriers, that have very low resources, taking away the nutritional support that they rely on is only gonna make those challenges harder. So that's one criticism. Ted, another criticism, you know, the Trump administration has given out uh, as much as $28 billion in subsidies to farmers because of this trade war. We're talking about $5 billion over five years to be saved from these uh, food stamp savings. It's kind of inconsistent there. Well, I don't know. You know, I think if you look at the, the economy, both nationally and in Illinois, this is the lowest rates of unemployment for blacks, for minorities, for Hispanics. It's an amazing time to get a job. It's an amazing time to get out of the dependency on food stamps. And so I think, um, I think in Illinois, maybe too many people, because of the waivers and because of the mess we've had economically, too many people are becoming dependent. And we have to break that dependence because I think, as, as Nolan mentioned, the best thing for people are jobs to find meaning in their lives, to be on food stamps for a long, long time and, and, and not have the impetus to go out and look for work. Nolan, it's, how, it's the wrong, wrong thing. How many people do you think in Illinois this rule change is going to affect? Paris, this could impact as many as 140,000 people here in Illinois. And what we know about every other area that has had to implement this time limit is that many of those people are going to lose benefits. In Illinois, this is not our first experience with this time limit recently. We did have one county in 2018 that had to implement it. That was DuPage County. And in DuPage County, after those three months, about half the people in this group that were receiving SNAP lost their benefits. And, and speaking of losing benefits in Cook County, uh, uh, about 50,000 people are going to lose their benefits under the current rule because Cook County's economy has improved. Um, is this sort of doubling the problem here for Cook County residents? Well, I, I don't know. I, I look at this as a big opportunity because with the economy so hot, with the unemployment rate so hot, and with you know, there's 80, is on Indeed.com, they're looking for 80,000 jobs in Illinois, so we have to do, do a better job of matching. But I think an important point is our neighboring states are doing far better than us at getting people off of food stamps. Uh, Indiana has 30% lower than during the Great Recession. We're 17% higher. We're going the wrong way, they're going the right way. We have to look at, the, at our economy and, and the, the, the policies we have that are keeping people out of jobs. Nolan, why are these states going in different directions? Why is Indiana having more success than Illinois? I mean, Paris, it's an important question, but I want to respond to this notion that the economy is booming and that there are just an abundance of jobs that are waiting to transport people out of poverty. The reality is that many of these jobs are low-paying jobs. They're part-time jobs. Some of these jobs are not even going to be sufficient for people to meet this work requirement. So when we talk about a booming economy, we have to recognize that the general unemployment rate does not paint the whole picture. In fact, what the Trump administration is saying here is that even in areas that have substantially higher unemployment than the national average, we're still going to be forcing folks to somehow find a job that's going to be able to get them uh, off of food stamps. It's just not realistic. Ted, another possible criticism here, uh, you know, again, we're talking about $5 billion to be saved over five years. When you consider the amount of taxes that are not being paid by some of the biggest companies in the country, IBM, General Motors, Amazon, I mean, doesn't that account for so much more money than what's being saved here? Well, I think, I think we have to be careful not to mix the things, right? There's, there's policies that we should change, uh, whatever they may be, when it comes to corporation and taxes and all that. And, and that's, a, I think, a separate discussion. What's really critical here, and I think it's, it's a situation for Illinois, is that you know, things like food stamps hide the real problems that we have in Illinois. We have a pension problem. We have an economic problem. Uh, we have an, an unemployment problem broadly. Um, the, the food stamps allow our government to hide behind those things. What we need to do is change our policy so we have more growth, more, more investment in Illinois, more inflow of companies to create better jobs for people. All right, Nolan Downey and Ted Dabrowski, we have to leave it there. Thank both of you. Thank you to both of you for being here. Thank Thanks you. Paris. And there's more Chicago tonight just ahead, so please stay with us.
This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by North Shore University Health System. Here's to the end of illness and the beginning of how healthcare should be. At North Shore, we're transforming your healthcare by analyzing your DNA to identify future health risks for you and working to stop illness before it begins. When you're a North Shore patient, your advanced primary care physician makes the latest genetic science part of your everyday care to keep you healthier longer. Advanced primary care. Here's to taking control of your health and taking on what's next. Just under a month to go until recreational pot is legal in Illinois, and the mayor is clarifying how Chicago police will handle the new law. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. And Paris, the mayor and interim police superintendent are addressing questions about how the state's new marijuana law will be enforced in Chicago. We're all working through um, the new world order together. Um, there's going to be um, the police department is putting out some specific training um, to make sure that officers understand that in this new world, um, uh, marijuana is obviously legalized. That changes entirely what the regulatory framework is going to be, and I expect them to, to follow the law. You know, after that news conference, Mayor Lori Lightfoot and Interim Police Superintendent Charlie Beck issued a joint statement saying, though the state's law prohibits using weed in a public place, the police department recognizes that using cannabis in your own backyard or balcony poses no threat to public safety, and residents shouldn't be arrested or ticketed for that alone. And be sure to check out our website for a guide to marijuana in Illinois. That's at WTTW.com slash pot guide. A Crystal Lake woman has pleaded guilty in the beating death of her five-year-old son back in April. 36-year-old Joanne Cunningham entered the plea in McHenry County today. We have, here she is right now, you can see her with her attorney back in April. Her son AJ was found beaten to death and buried in a shallow grave in Woodstock. Cunningham faces 20 to 60 years in prison and is scheduled to be sentenced at a later date. The boy's father, Andrew Friend, is still facing first-degree murder charges. AJ's death sparked a state investigation into the Department of Children and Family Services efforts to keep families intact when there have been reports of chi child endangerment. Illinois State Senator Thomas Cullerton will face trial next summer on federal embezzlement charges. Jury selection begins July 21st. Cullerton, who is a distant cousin of outgoing State Senate President John Cullerton, is accused of pocketing $275,000 in salary and benefits from the Teamsters Union despite doing little or no work. The 39-year-old Democrat from Villa Park was indicted in August on 39 counts of embezzlement and additional counts of conspiracy and making false statements. And new charges tonight for singer R. Kelly. These dating back to his 1994 marriage to singer Aaliyah. An indictment unsealed in federal court in New York accuses the disgraced R&B star for scheming or of scheming to pay for a quote fraudulent identification document for someone identified as Jane Doe in August of 94. The next day, he and then 15 year old Aaliyah Houghton got married in a secret ceremony. It was annulled months later because of her age. Kelly's defense attorney calls this latest charge ridiculous and absurd. Kelly is facing multiple charges for different crimes in several states, including Illinois. As for the weather, tonight mostly cloudy with low around 32. Then for your Friday, mostly sunny with a high near 38. Now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. And now to some of today's top business headlines. Here's Crane's Chicago business editor, Ann Dwyer. Thanks, Paris. United Airlines CEO Oscar Munoz is stepping down from the top job at the Chicago-based carrier. Munoz was named CEO in September 2015, just before suffering a severe heart attack and heart transplant. Munoz will hand the reins to current President Scott Kirby in May. During his tenure, the carrier withstood the firestorm that followed the 2017 dragging of a passenger off a United plane. Meanwhile, DePaul College Prep's Irving Park campus has officially hit the market, roughly four months after the Catholic High School announced it would move from its location at Addison in California. The seven-acre site near the north branch of the Chicago River is zoned to allow for townhomes, senior housing, and multifamily housing. It's also next to the highly anticipated Riverview Bridge, a $13 million project that will become the city's longest pedestrian river bridge. The broker representing the school tells Cranes it's already fielded multiple offers for the site. 
And finally, Fulton Market is about to get yet another high-profile restaurant. Dynamic Hospitality, which owns Prime and Provisions and Bar Siena, is debuting a new eatery at 905 West Fulton Market, the same building that will soon be anchored by Mondelez International's global headquarters. For Crane's Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann Dwyer. Back to you, Paris. Thanks, Ann. Remember the days when the only option for watching a movie from your couch was to pay for HBO or to visit a video rental store? I remember those. Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy in 2010, but there are still a few places to rent movies, including Odd Obsession Movies in Chicago's Bucktown neighborhood. Our Amanda Vinicky paid a visit. This is probably what your TV screen looks like when you're searching for something to watch. Endlessly scrolling through your go-to streaming service, hoping that something, anything, looks good. Now, check out the shelves at Odd Obsession. This is a collection of movies that we would kind of consider a library or an archive. But to become an archive or to become a library is quite complicated. Um, so on the surface, we're a video rental store. We're just like a blockbuster was, but much cooler with... Uh, with 25,000 titles subcategorized by director. 25,000 titles. According to the search engine Flexible, Netflix offers less than 4,000 movies. You have to sort through so much garbage you have to sift through in order to find something good on most streaming sites. I think that um, the human element is, is being drawn out of movie recommendations. Everybody is getting fed like an algorithm. And the algorithms aren't perfect yet, and they're also kind of impersonal. At Odd Obsession Video, Brown, Mesa, or one of the other volunteers is always on hand to help point you in the right direction. I still feel a little bit nervous about having my recommended section up. I have about like eight titles up there, and I'm like, people are looking at, you know, but people have rented them, and then they tell me about how they like it, and um, it's pretty cool. You heard me right earlier, by the way, when I described Meza as a volunteer. Nobody who works at Odd Obsession gets paid. Though there is candy and popcorn, and volunteers are welcome to watch movies while they're on the clock. The average volunteer puts in between 600 to 700 hours a year. Probably three months into it, I started a spreadsheet so I could keep track of all the movies I watch on shift because I'm here for eight hours, so I have time to watch four or five movies in a shift. Um, so I've discovered a lot just walking around and grabbing things. Memberships are available, but anyone can come in from off the street to rent, or in some cases, buy a movie from Odd Obsession. The whole point, organizers say, is to make it accessible to film students, movie aficionados, or just random passers-by. At Odd Obsessions Movies, you can rent classics like The Breakfast Club, but the real draw is the sort of movies you can't easily find on streaming services, like A Brick and $9.99. We have stuff that you can't find anywhere else in the world, not online. The internet doesn't have it. Uh, we do, which is wild, just wild. Odd Obsession began in 2005 as just that, really. One man's odd obsession with movies. The story is that he maxed out a couple credit cards and started buying all the movies that he wanted, you know, that he was excited about. And then a group of friends who are also film freaks just formed around it. And then the collection has grown. It has many fingerprints on it, and it's so it's grown organically. But it also almost organically died. The shop's been hemorrhaging money. That original owner's phasing out his connection to Odd Obsession, and the team needed to raise $25,000 to buy the movie collection. Not to mention the matter of paying rent. With support from Chicago's film community, donors, and new members, a just-completed campaign fundraised $16,000. A private investor came through with the rest. I would say we are still kind of in danger. We're an endangered species. While Odd Obsession video is sticking with old school video, they are looking to modernize by selling more merchandise, holding screenings, also by spreading the word on social media that video rental shops haven't gone the way of the dinosaur yet. Hi. Hello. If all goes as planned, Odd Obsession never will. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Amanda Vinicky. And if you're curious about Odd Obsession movie staff favorites, we've got a video of their top picks on our website. And we're back with more right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. 
Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. A show of historical photographs shines light on a dark chapter of World War II. When the Nazis made a ghetto in the central Polish city of Ludz, one man trapped inside took thousands of pictures. He had an official capacity as an ID photographer, but he risked his life to take other photos that documented the truth. We recently brought you this story. Here's another look. At the Illinois Holocaust Museum, there are unexpected snapshots of happy couples, families, and people trying to live normal lives in traumatic situations. There are propaganda photographs showing the lie that everything was all right in the Ludge Ghetto, where Jews were working in leather and mattress factories for the German war effort. And there are secretly taken photos that reveal the terrifying reality. The pictures were taken by this man, Henrik Ross. He was officially, as a statistics photographer, he photographed identification photos uh, for people. He was able to stockpile films from there. And he had to do official photography for the German propaganda because, of course, the goal was to show that Lodge Ghetto was, in fact, a profitable undertaking. There are many images about the Holocaust that many of us know, many of the liberation camp images. Um, it is may be confusing to people to see that there are dinner parties and dances, but these are also the, in the earlier years of the Ludge Ghetto, but people needed to continue living, and so they had marriages, and they had babies, and they had celebration. These are expressions of hope and resilience. He gave people dignity in the portraiture that he took of them, and the people smiled back. In the Ludge Ghetto, 160,000 Jews were segregated and isolated. The number swelled to more than 200,000, including Roma people. All the Jews were rounded up. They had to move out of their own homes. Uh, were allowed to take uh, maybe a suitcase or just a few possessions. There was a huge sign outside that you know warned people that this is Jews only. You can you couldn't enter the ghetto. As the situation became increasingly dire, Henrik Ross and his wife documented the deprivation and the deportations to death camps. When the ghetto was almost completely liquidated, he buried his negatives. He and his wife, Stefania, were chosen to be part of the crew that stayed in the ghetto, cleaned up the ghetto, and that is how he survived. Near the end of the war, he returned and unearthed his archive. Half of the 6,000 images were destroyed. Others were badly damaged. In 1961, Henrik Ross testified at the trial of Adolf Eichmann, and his photographs were entered into the record. You mean you saw people being shot and yeah. beaten Those when they refused to sick. enter the train? There was a hole in the plank, and I photographed through that hole. Ross said that the pictures showed a record of our tragedy, a historical record of martyrdom. This touring exhibition came from the Art Gallery of Ontario. It concludes with a collage of images the photographer made many years later when he tried to process his experience. It is a puzzle of memory. It's a good puzzle to have in the end, too, because it shows the artist trying to grapple with his own past and what he lived through. It took him all those years to deal with that, that trauma. These are very complicated stories on how people survived. Henrik Ross died in 1991 in Israel. The exhibition of his photographs is called Memory Unearthed. It is at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center in Skokie, and it runs until January 12th. You can see more of the photos on our website. Up next, we hear some of your thoughts on the city's handling of bike lane complaints, so stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. Before we go tonight, some viewer feedback. Many of you weighed in on our story this week about cyclists who said the city wasn't addressing their complaints about blocked bike lanes. There's a follow-up story on our website up right now, so here's what some of you had to say. I love to ride bicycles, but I won't ride in the city due to the aggression displayed by drivers. It is sometimes perilous to walk around downtown. The bicycle riders do not follow any of the bicycle safety rules. These people that ride their bicycles are the most unsafe ever. 
They should be a made to pass a safety course and be licensed to ride on the streets of the city. As Governor Pritzker prepares to sell the Thompson Center, a group of preservationists are fighting to save it. You shared your thoughts on the downtown government building. I've always warmed to this building and I don't want to see it demolished. It epitomizes government in this pitiful state, excessive and wasteful. It costs too much to fix up, it costs too much to maintain. The state does not have the money for any of this. No matter what you think of the building, it is an interesting tour. As always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter or post your comments on our website. And that's our show for this Thursday night, abbreviated so we can bring you special pledge programming. And please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. And check out our website for a new guide to marijuana in Illinois. There you can find a countdown to legalization, information on the state's law, a map of dispensaries, and much more information updated frequently. You can find the guide at WTTW.com slash pot guide. We leave you tonight with a visit to the Chris Kindle Market located in Daly Plaza and open until December 24th. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.